2020 royally sucked ass for many people and for a lot of obvious reasons. Quality escapism has never been more important to me than it has been this past year. Simply taking my mind off things through video games is a luxury that I'm more thankful for for the people that create them than ever before in my life. So with the past year in the rearview mirror, I'm excited to kick off this decade with my personalized top 10 games from 2020. If there's one standout aspect within the realm of video games this year, even with the shiny new console hardware, it's simply how many older games can still be great with a fresh new look or reimagined approach. Keep in mind, I did miss out on some notable releases, including The Last of Us Part 2, Ghost of Tsushima, Doom Eternal, and Hades, which was Destructoid's 2020 Game of the Year pick. This is unfortunate considering all these games are racking up numerous awards from other outlets, but it'll make my ever-growing backlog all the more exciting. Black Mesa was technically released almost a decade ago, 2012 to be exact. However, the game officially released earlier this year in March, fully complete and with a reimagined its Zen to celebrate the occasion. Its Zen was arguably the weakest segment for the original Half-Life, and Crowbar Collective's take on this alien world is a vast improvement. New additions such as the HEV suit headcrab zombies and completely redesigned areas turn what was once a chore to go through in the original into an exciting last stretch in this fantastic remake. However, it does go long. This new take on it, Zen, although an overall improvement, lasts a solid chunk of hours your first time through. Combine that with fairly dated visuals by today's standards and lackluster AI at times, and Black Mesa certainly still feels like a game from a decade ago. But if you've never played the Half-Life games, it's still a damn fine place to start. Oh, man. Put that down. It's a prototype. Why aren't we using this thing? It's much too unpredictable. Open it overcharge. What do you mean overcharge? <laughs> Animal Crossing New Horizons is one of the most heartfelt and positive games to come out of this miserable year. It was arguably the best kind of escapism that so many people sorely needed. For me though, it was the Animal Crossing game I fell off the fastest due to just how many other games grabbed my attention this year. That said, I'll still probably be revisiting my island for many more years to come. You know, between all the months I've forgotten about it and then have to pick weeds all day. At least I'm not the mayor this time. Photography is a hobby I definitely want to dive into at some point. An Umurandi generation captures those best moments of capturing those best moments. However, it also has a gorgeous visual style and soundtrack seemingly right out of Jet Set Radio. Combine that with unique world building and environmental storytelling depicting an ongoing world crisis with some incredibly memorable photography mechanics, like taking a picture of something massive off in the distance, only to then be terrified of what you just shot after just in the exposure. And it's a game I won't soon forget. Full disclosure, I also happen to be a friend of the developer, shouts out Basilikov, so take this with a grain of salt if need be. But if cool visuals, good music, and chill photography is up your alley, I don't think it'll disappoint. The original Final Fantasy VII holds a lot of nostalgia for me in that it's both the first JRPG and Final Fantasy game I ever played. Looking back, I hardly ever replayed it. So when I first played the remake earlier this year, it gave me goosebumps just seeing the world brought to life and with so much more attention to detail than I could have ever imagined. The newly remit soundtrack also has some of the best background music in video games I've ever heard, straight up. Throw in some actual depth to the action RPG combat in tandem with the materia system, and I was a pretty happy camper all around. Until the ending came along. But even then, I'm still fairly excited, if not morbidly curious, to see where they'll be taking things next. After over a decade of disappointment, I went into Tony Hawk Pro Stater 1 Plus 2 with a fair bit of caution, especially after Tony Hawk's Pro Stater 5. Thankfully, that feeling of caution quickly dissipated as I began performing combos, collecting state letters, and melting into my chair to the sounds of pop punk. Time slipped away as I played the entirety of both campaigns and I'm still craving more of it. As much as I'd love to see Visceral games give the same accurate treatment to Tony Hawk's Pro Stater 3 and 4, or even the Underground games for that matter, I can't help but be curious what they could pull off with their own original take on a game. Basically, Activision should hand the keys to the Tony Hawk series over to Visceral and let them go absolutely hog wild with it.
I managed to squeeze in a full playthrough for Cyberpunk 2077 before 2020 came to an end. And although it failed to deliver on last-gen consoles, what's here, when it works, is fantastic. Chris Carter truly said it best in his review that it's just fun to hang out. Simply exploring Night City, discovering odd jobs, taking in the scenery, and driving funky retro-futuristic vehicles hooked me in the right ways to keep progressing despite the technical hiccups. If you're still on the fence about playing it, absolutely wait it out. I guarantee you once the next-gen versions of Cyberpunk 2077 are available, along with the insert edition that includes all the DLC, a year or two from now, it'll be a much more stable and complete experience. Cyberpunk 2077 on last-gen consoles is just not worth the technical hassle and should have been cancelled and billed as a next-gen only experience. Sure, they would have taken a big financial hit without those last-gen sales, but Cyberpunk 2077 would have placed better on my personalized top 10 list. CDPR truly missed out on the Dan recognition factor, and the exciting possibilities that go with that. Despite only being a roughly two hour experience, I've spent probably dozens of hours into replaying the game off and on with different characters, and I'm still in disbelief Streets of Rage 4 is even a reality, and that it's this good of a game. Streets of Rage was a series I thought doomed to forever being re-released in various collections, and nothing more. Thankfully, something or someone at Sega spurred them on to finally give the series another lease on life, and it's goddamn glorious. With new music from the original composer, new mechanics such as a wrist slash reward system and using special moves, and dealing damage to regain health, and a large cast of characters new and old, Streets of Rage 4 is pretty much a perfect follow-up to the original trilogy. Here's hoping we don't have to wait as long for another one. Until Dawn was a game that flipped my expectations in the best possible ways. So when Supermassive announced the Dark Pictures Anthology, I was all aboard that hype train. Sadly, its debut title, Man of Medan, didn't capture that same magic. It was instead exactly what I expected and fell flat for me in a lot of ways. It showed its cards way too soon and its horror gimmick was far too predictable. Little Hope, however, kept me guessing right until the very end and captured my interest the whole way through, thanks to the formulas they've done right with character-driven storytelling and choice-driven cinematic horror. Throw in some Silent Hill inspirations, my all-time favorite horror series, and Little Hope ended up being one of my favorite games of the year. For whatever reason, I never got around to actually playing any of the Souls games. I've always had this mentality of playing games within a series by release order, and lately, playing older games has fallen more and more by the wayside due to constantly keeping up with new releases. So with the announcement of the Demon Souls remake, I knew this was the perfect opportunity to dive in and see what I've been missing finally. My first day could be summarized as constant death and frustration. Most folks would have probably called it a day or played something else entirely. Still, something about Demon Souls kept me coming back for more. Whether it was the gorgeous visuals and atmosphere, or simply chasing that feeling of overcoming its many challenges. I can only imagine this is an ancient Tate by now, but Demon's Souls thrives off not only the challenge it presents, but in the reward of seeing more of it. Each of its worlds continues to become more grotesque and all the more interesting to witness firsthand. No matter how long it took me to progress in a specific world, I would always look forward to seeing more of it. From frantically running across the bridge in Boletaria, to getting lost down in the tunnels of Tunnel City, Demon's Souls made me work for every inch of its incredible atmosphere. Bluepoint did an outstanding job making it all the more beautiful and turning Demon's Souls into a launch title I'll never forget. In 2017, Mark Laidlaw put up a blog on his personal website titled Epistol 3, breaking down what essentially would have been the story for the now cancelled Half-Life 2 Episode 3. At the time, I thought that was the final nail in the coffin of the franchise and that Valve had simply moved on from Half-Life. So I did the same. Half-Life in my mind was this great but unfinished and dead franchise. I was convinced it was never returning due to an endless list of factors. So when Half-Life Alex was announced, it felt like a fever dream. 
I remember the moment I finished watching the announcement trailer. I knew right there and then I had to get my hands and head on a VR headset. The technology is great, but I couldn't help but feel anxious about finally playing a new Half-Life. How do you revive a series that ended on a cliffhanger over a decade ago and live up to the mountain of expectations that go with it? Especially for a series that, with each mainline entry, set new standards for first-person shooters. I went in asking these questions, and by the time I was done with Half-Life Alex, I was floored with Valve's answers to them. Literally stepping into Alex Vance's shoes and experiencing the world of Half-Life within VR can't be done justice without trying it for yourself. Little details like picking up a trash can lid to block head crabs from fornicating with your face, to just the sheer sense of scale you feel when looking up at everything around you. But what amazed me even more than the incredible technology was just how well written and thought out Half-Life Alex was. Going into why would include way too many spoilers. So I'll just say this. Half-Life Alex ends on a note that has me more excited than ever for where Half-Life could be doing next, and it completely reignited my fandom for this series. That alone makes it my personal Game of the Year. But for more written reviews, news, and even more personalized Game of the Year lists from our staff, and more, be sure to head on over to Destruct Toy... Uh, there it is, dot com.